70 million acres of wide open possibilities. Nevada is untouched. A place where the desert comes to life, the ground holds the history, and nature perseveres. In 1951, we kind of got back into nuclear testing in high gear because the Cold War was really heating up. I experienced the impact of the atomic age at the National Atomic Testing Museum. So this is where the first bomb was dropped on the United States on January 27, 1951. I get a first-hand look at Nevada's radioactive past at the Nevada National Security Site. And uh, our tavern license is 001. It's the oldest freestanding bar in Nevada. And. I celebrate the past and present at Atomic Liquors. Ah! Pretty spectacular, isn't it? Nevada's like that. I'm John Burke. Join me as I explore the seventh largest state in the nation, here on Outdoor Nevada. Physicist Robert Oppenheimer, upon witnessing the first successful test of an atomic bomb, recalled, a few people laughed, a few people cried, most were silent. He then remarked, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. This would be the first of over a thousand nuclear tests conducted by the United States, an event that would forever change the world. In the center of Las Vegas, the National Atomic Testing Museum stands as a reminder that the atomic bomb is as much a part of Vegas history and identity as neon lights and showgirls. Hey, Michael, what a pleasure. Nice to meet you. How old is the museum and who made sure that it got here? We're starting in our 13th year, and it was really founded by a lot of veterans of the test site who worked out there for many years and wanted to tell the important historical story. The relics of the museum are from a time not that long ago, but some of them seem like they're from an entirely different world. The atomic bomb was the tipping point of a new era for mankind, and here you can see all the way back to its origins. Let's go back to the beginning. How did this whole thing begin? Was it with Albert Einstein? He was the one that wrote the famous letter to President Roosevelt warning that uh, Nazi Germany could be on a road of a developing atomic weapon. So that's what really spurred the Manhattan Project, our project during World War II to develop, to, to build an atomic weapon. The Manhattan Project was the combined efforts of legendary geniuses such as Einstein, Oppenheimer, and Enrico Fermi, scientists from across the world working with the U.S. and British governments to defeat the Axis powers. Their first bomb would be completed in Los Alamos, New Mexico in 1945. In 1951, we kind of got back into nuclear testing in high gear because the Cold War was really heating up. Russia tested their first bomb in 1949, and that upset everybody. And we needed a place here stateside that was actually close to New Mexico, and in 1951, the Nevada test site opened up. And what exactly were they testing out there, and how were they doing it? Well, from 1951 to 1963, they did 100 above-ground tests, mainly of atomic weapons, something on the scale of what we think of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, in the order of a kiloton to about uh, 50 kilotons. From the instant of that first blast until Hiroshima vanished from the list of living cities, closely guarded plants in New Mexico, Tennessee, and the state of Washington continued their work to shorten the war. 50 kilotons is a big bomb, but nothing like what we would later develop. Eventually, the fission technology gave way to fusion, and thermonuclear devices with nearly limitless potential were created. Following World War II, Americans associated the atomic bomb with civil defense and security, a culture formed that admired their terrible, awe-inspiring beauty. It had to affect, somehow, the city of Las Vegas at the time. How did it do that? Well, you know, to me, that's the most interesting story. I mean, we talk a lot about the bombs and the test, but to me, the, the biggest story is the legacy that over the years, so many jobs were brought to this area by the testing at the test site. Over 200,000 people came to this community over a 30, 40 year period and settled here. And it literally brought Las Vegas from a population of 33,000 to almost 2 million in the Valley today. This really 
infected the public consciousness with pop culture, didn't it? It really came alive. It eventually led to that in the heyday of the uh, early 1950s. I mean, everything was atomic this and atomic that, and it was really it became part of our national identity in a big way. The atomic age was here. Tests were advertised in advance to promote tourism. A Miss Atomic Bomb was crowned, and atomic cocktails were toasted across town. Atomic Energy was going to defend America, power its homes and cars, and take us to new worlds. So then things began to turn a little bit. We began to see these films of houses being just blown away and, and mannequins being destroyed. And I think a certain fear began to set in as to what this could really be. Gradually, uh, atomic weapons became less popular. You're absolutely right. And that was another one of the tests they did out at the test site was to do tests on wooden structures, concrete structures, you know, military hardware, to see what would actually happen if a nuclear war came, how these things would survive it. And that all led to the Limited Test Ban Treaty of 1963. And I think it's a very remarkable thing that we have President John F. Kennedy and Premier Khrushchev that faced one another just a year before in the Cold War. Now they were trying to come together and put through a treaty that forced testing underground to make it safer and to eliminate the fallout of nuclear waste. Amid growing concerns of fallout from the Nevada test site reaching Utah and Arizona, all testing moved underground. This newly required technology has not been duplicated or topped to this day. Let's talk about actual size. How big are these bombs? How big were they? How big are they today? Well, the, the bomb we dropped on, you know, um, Hiroshima or Nagasaki were about the size of a, a large car, a small bus. Uh, that was a problem because when we developed rocket technology that also came out of World War II, they wanted to eventually, eventually marry an atomic weapon to the head of a missile. And it had to be much, much smaller to do that. That was the reason for a lot of the initial atomic testing, to make the physical size of the device smaller. Started out about the size of a small car or a bus, and today, how small are these weapons? You can get the, the nuclear core as small as a tennis ball today. That's, that's, that's frightening. This is an incredible piece of technology that we're looking at here. Tell me about it. This is called a rack or canister. <clears throat> and in the days of underground testing, most of the testing was done in deep vertical shafts. When you go to test the device, you just don't throw the bomb in the bottom of the hole, you lower it on a canister because the whole point of nuclear testing is to get good diagnostic information back. An incredibly complicated, precise process because the hole had to be perfect. Had to be dug perfectly straight because there wasn't a lot of clearance between the side of the rack and the side of the hole. And at that point, nobody had ever drilled a hole that big, had they? That's right, a whole new drilling technology had to be developed at the test site. And again, it brought even more workers and craftsmen into, into this region. The Nevada test site performed 824 underground tests with only a single incident of leaking. While much was learned, the fear of fallout and the looming threat of mutually assured destruction eventually brought nuclear testing to a close across most of the globe. Okay, it's official. Whether you're interested in science or culture or history or even ethics, the Atomic Testing Museum is an absolute must. But now, I'm gonna take it to another level, going to the site itself. If you are at all interested in Nevada and American history, you can and you should come here to the Nevada National Security Site. Let's go look around, I got your clearance. The atomic test site is divided into about 30 areas, each with their own history, some of them still active today. Darwin Morgan, Director of Public Affairs, guides me across the immense space to points of interest. First on the list is Area 5, also known as Frenchman Flat. We are in Frenchman Flat. Huge historical significance. Tell me about this place. So this is where the first bomb was dropped on the United States in January 27, 1951. And we did a total of 14 atmospheric tests on this dry lake bed. But help me out. I thought that we were testing in the South Pacific back at the time. 
So the United States was doing all of its testing in the Pacific, but it was a big haul to get there. The safety, the security started to weigh on the scientists and the politicians. And so a decision was made to look for an on-continent test site to do the lower yield tests. On December 18, 1950, the president signed the paperwork establishing the Nevada Proving Grounds. 45 calendar days later, they dropped the first bomb on the United States. Incredible. Now, now what about the structures that are here? What am I looking at? So these are all structures that were to understand the heat and blast effect on a different type of structure. So you have a bridge right here, and they wanted to understand what was going to happen to it, and they were able to see that the I-beams basically turned into pieces of spaghetti when that heat hit it, the force hits it, and they just got that U-curve that's in them. It was just fantastic. What about the, uh, the bank vault? So there is a bank vault out here working back at the time with the Mosler Bank Vault Company, built a bank vault so they could understand how to make a bank vault that's going to survive. If we're in a nuclear war, we have a nuclear catastrophe. Is the money going to be safe? <laughs> and yes, everything inside the bank vault survived. It took a 20-ton crane to pull the door off of its hinges. Now, I know ground zero for, for these tests were, were close by. They're probably what, half a mile away? We're within half mile, three quarters of a mile of ground zero. Uh, they wanted to have the structures close to the ground zero and then repeated those different structures at varying distances so they could see what the heat and blast would be at this distance, at this distance, and further out. What about today when people come out here? What do you see, how do you see them react? So we bring out monthly public tours here. And when the people come out and see this, there's, there is a silence as they recognize the power of the atomic bomb, what it could do, because these structures sit here in silent homage to that time and are able to show people what exactly happened and what the force of those bombs could be. That's exactly, you just said it exactly right. There's this silence and then there's this feeling, at least inside of me, of just awe. It's just incredible. Some tests gauge the destructive power of atomic weapons, while others explore the constructive applications of controlled blasts. The area known as Sedan bears the results of this experiment, a scar in the earth four football fields long and 300 feet deep. You know, Darwin, when you first come up to Sedan, this area, it, it literally is breathtaking. Give me some details about this. So there was a program for peaceful uses of nuclear weapons. It was called the Plowshare Program. And the entire idea of this was to see if you could use a nuclear bomb to dig another Panama-type canal, if you could make bigger harbors for the ships to come into. This was to see if you could use a nuclear device for digging. So what did they do? They, they dug a hole and, and put a device down there and exploded it? So they took a 104 kiloton nuclear bomb, put it down 635 feet, and it created the crater that we're standing in front of today. And what did they find out, that you could use this for canals? Because I don't recall that ever being done. Right, so in theory, it works perfectly. It's a great idea, but the problem and the issue is, and the United States never did this, is because of the residual radiation that you have left behind. Boy, that explosion must have just been incredible. To see the video of it, to see the cloud as it's forming, and you see these rocks blowing away, those rocks are the size of VW vans. It's easy to come here and be floored by the scale of the devastation left in the wake of testing, but more impressive are the structures built later to contain and minimize damage. Towers like Ice Cap mark where the tests went underground. Ice Cap is a tower which was going to be the last underground test by the United States in 1992. We were working to conduct this test, but the nation said, we're going to go into a moratorium. We're not going to do any more nuclear testing. And so we have this facility kind of sitting here as a showcase to show what it took to conduct an underground nuclear test. How close was it to being functional, to working? It was within four to six weeks of the test being conducted. It's almost like they just locked the doors. Right. They, they walked away. Literally, you can walk into buildings at, from the end of testing, including ice cap, and still see telephone books from the time and some of the papers on the desk, the coffee cups, the empty coffee cups, pens, pencils. They just literally, like you said, walked away, shut the doors, locked them, and walked away. Despite all the relics on the surface, only 100 nuclear tests ever occurred above ground. Over 820 tests were conducted in subterranean shafts. These towers allowed workers to safely prep the experiments below. So this is where the device would be located. This entire area would have a shield around it. 
and then the pumps, like I was telling you below, would bring that cold air, and they would bring it to a vacuum. So replicate. that would be the nuclear device. That's, there. Where, That's where it would where be, is sitting. in that location right there. And then looking at the device, you have all of these various pipes that are looking at different angles of it. They're looking at different places within the device so they can understand what's happening in that millionth of a second. And they're getting hundreds and hundreds of data points from that that are going up these cables, again, before this entire thing is vaporized. Was, was that the relative size? That is a mock-up that's put in there just to show you where the device was going to be. At the time, we had a treaty with the Russians that allowed them to verify our test to make sure that we were not exceeding the 150 kilotons. They had full access to this to assure that we were not um, cheating on the 150 kiloton limit. So they would come and inspect? They had the option on this particular test to do it. They chose not to. The former nuclear test site no longer tests atomic weapons but proudly continues to use its environment to gather information and practical solutions in the name of national defense. It's rare to find a spot that is so historic and so current and active at the same time. Tell me about this area. So back on May 5th, 1955, this was the site of a 29 kiloton test called the Apple II test. And the test itself is historic in that it was the test that you see that famous footage of the houses, which some still are standing back there, of the houses being destroyed that had the mannequins inside of it. So this was where we're standing is really kind of ground zero for that explosion. And those houses that are still standing are about how far? We're looking at the nearest house that we can see is about 7,500 feet from us, and the furthest house is at 10,000 feet from us. That is just amazing. And yet today, this is very active. So local law enforcement from around the country come here to train? So after the Murrah Federal Building bombing in Oklahoma City, it was determined that our firefighters, police officers, really didn't understand how to use radiation detection equipment. So they asked, is there anybody that can teach them how to do it? We said here at the Nevada National Security Site, we can teach you how to do that in a real world environment where there's real radiation, where a real nuclear bomb went off. See, I think most people think of this site and they think of, well, that's where those bombs went off a long time ago. Don't really realize that there's still a lot going on here. Right, and with the residual radiation at safe levels that we can bring first responders into, we can take a historic site and turn it into something to help our national security today. Though active nuclear testing stopped in the 90s, there's still maintenance required. The JASPER system functions as part of the stewardship program, upkeeping the U.S.'s current nuclear arsenal. We're at a facility called JASPER. What is that? JASPER stands for Joint Actinide Shock Physics Experimental Research. This is the only gun that you can fire a projectile at a piece of plutonium. So how does it work in layman's terms? Sure. So on this end here, you have this piston that is driven by high explosives. It travels down this tube. It compresses a gas. And as that gas builds up the pressures going down the tube, it ruptures this valve. And you can feel how heavy that is. And on the other side of it is this projectile, 28 millimeter projectile that is shot 30 feet down this at 18,000 miles per hour or eight kilometers per second. That's a lot of force. What I can't wrap my head around is that this thing is going eight kilometers per second in 30 feet. Show me where it ends up. Sure. The Jasper fires a projectile into a plutonium target, subjecting the material to high pressure, temperature, and strain. The shot collects information about the stability of the isotope and the viability of our nuclear arsenal. This is the secondary confinement chamber, and what would be sitting inside here is the primary containment chamber that collects the, the projectile as it comes in and hits the plutonium. Amazing. Now, if that chamber were breached or there was damage, this would contain everything. Yes, that's why we have the secondary chamber. Why? Why are we doing all this? So this is just one of the tools that we have that helps us understand what's going on with our nuclear weapons. The scientists take the data from all of those experimental capabilities that we have at these facilities, put it together, and they're able to assure the continued safety, reliability of our nuclear weapons without having to do underground nuclear testing. 
One of my great passions in life is to learn things. And so you have ignited my passion today because this has been fascinating to me. You've really taught me a lot and I can't thank you enough for spending the day with you. You're welcome. It is impossible to remove the images of destruction from the atomic bomb era, but the knowledge found by wartime scientists informs the public, saves lives, and safely maintains nuclear energy sources and dormant weapons. As the expression goes, turning swords into plowshares. This is one of my favorite kind of days, it really is. It combines science, history, exploration, great outdoors. On January 27, 1951, scientists and high-level military personnel sat right here and watched as the first bomb was dropped on the United States. But just 75 miles that way, there was another kind of viewing audience, and it was totally different. There's one last stop on our trip through atomic Las Vegas. It's a cozy little tavern that has lasted through the ages. May not have had a bomb drop directly on it, but the atomic bomb's impact can still be felt. There's a peculiar addendum to this story. Why all that activity was going on out in the desert, what were the citizens of nearby Las Vegas doing? They were coming to this bar, going up on the roof, grabbing a chair and a cocktail, and watching the bombs go off. This is Atomic Liquors, the oldest freestanding bar in Las Vegas, open for over 50 years. This place has seen it all, but as you can gather from the name, it has a particularly interesting history regarding the atomic bomb. Lydon, how you doing, buddy? Doing well, doing well. Good nice to see you. you as well. Give me a little history of this place. So originally, this opened in 1946 as Virginia's Cafe. Virginia was the mother of Stella Sobchik, and Joe and Stella Sobchik owned Atomic Liquors, when we came to Atomic Liquors in 1952. In 1952, the cafe closed down, they stopped serving food, and it became a bar. Later on, they added an attachment, which would then become the liquor store. So locals could come, hang out in a you know, friendly environment where you're a cocktail lounge, and then you could also take something on your way home if you wanted to as well. And uh, our tavern license is 001. It's the oldest freestanding bar in Nevada. After that, I guess, is when the atomic testing started? Yes. So they started doing a atomic testing about 56 miles that way, and they would go up on the roof, and it's not, there's no theater seating or anything. I mean, these were just folks putting a ladder up against the bar, <laughs> shimmying their way up there, and then watching the atomic bombs go off. And that's 56 miles. 56 miles. Not that far. No, not far enough. And they're out there with what, lawn chairs oh, and, yeah, and a beer? Yeah. Sunglasses, sunscreen, you know, and you're set. Watch the atomic bombs go off, you know? They didn't know. I mean, of course not, yeah. Even if they did, it'd be still a cool thing to watch. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think it, the city would have vacated if they would have known what we know now. The frenzy of the atomic era gave atomic liquors its name, numerous anecdotes, and a popular drink on the menu. But the bar was also a hot spot for A-list celebrities. Is this a place where the Rat Pack would come? Absolutely, oh. yeah. So this is actually one of Barbara Streisand's first gigs. We still have her chair in here with the stars on the back. And just in case. In just, case. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, she would, she would sit there and she would talk to Stella, because her and Stella were really good friends. So they would sit and they would chat, and then she, Babs would go on and do her little show. And um, it was kind of a sanctuary because it was a place where celebrities could go and hang out, and you, know, you weren't going to be bombarded by people. So it's a rumor, can't confirm it, but actually uh, one of the old uh, managers who used to work here said he actually confiscated an ID, a fake ID from Elvis, who was trying to get in through the door. Come it can't on. be confirmed, but I wouldn't doubt it. That I wouldn't is an doubt it. Epic Las Vegas story, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. It's gone through some renovations throughout the years. Absolutely, yeah. So we, we do have a, an original wall which holds all the original signage from the original atomic bar, as well as our neon sign. And we have a cigarette machine inside, fully functional. So it's been around since then too. So it's kind of cool to think like who's pulled cigarettes out of this thing. It must be satisfying to know that you're not just slinging drinks, but you are a curator of Las Vegas and American history. Absolutely. Um, I think bringing that knowledge to people who come from out of town, and they don't have a sense of Las Vegas history. They come in and they see the big lights and they see the strip, but Atomic is still kind of tucked away in its own little spot, which is nice. So when you walk into this bar, you could be walking into the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. It doesn't really matter because you're going to fit right in because everybody oh. has been there along the way. Beautiful. Though Atomic Liquors celebrates Las Vegas' historic past, it also adds something new to the local scene. Next door, the Atomic Kitchen showcases emerging breweries and out-of-market libations for their thirsty customers to try. It would be a privilege for me to sample one of these beers Absolutely. with you. Absolutely. And before we do that, I need to know a little bit about sour beer. 
Absolutely. So there are a lot, many different styles of sour beers and lambics that we will be offering today. So this is actually a local beer. This is by Joseph James. They're out of Henderson, Nevada. So this is actually a blend of every sour beer that Joseph James has ever made. It's called Rose's Lair. So it's gonna have a little bit of tartness to it. It's gonna have a really strong, good fruit back. So this is actually a blend of ale. So it's gonna be a little on the lower ABV and a little more fruitier than some tend to be. We have some that can be very, very tart, some that are a little less tart and more fruit. Well, I gotta tell you, this is a blend, but so is this bar. It's a blend of the past and of the future and uh, obviously of today. And I'm just having a great time. It's been a great time hanging out with Cheers. you. Thanks a lot. My day ends at Atomic Liquors with a cool drink in my hand. I guess some things have stayed very much the same in Vegas since the 50s. We may not love the bomb like we once did, but our love for the era and our Vegas heritage remains. Support for Outdoor Nevada comes from Jaguar Land Rover Las Vegas and Jaguar Land Rover Reno. Inspiring the spirit of adventure with confidence in any terrain or conditions. Information at jlrlv.com or jlrreno.com.